Hello. Hi there. Be good. Yeah. <laughs> Terrible. I like that you have your priorities. Oh, of course. Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Check, check, check. Check one, two, check, check one, two. Check one, two.
You're good to go. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming today to the Iowa Files. My name is David Dubchak, and I'm the owner and producer of Conjunction Media. And uh, we are happy to be the streaming provider for the Iowa Files this year. We've worked on a couple of projects with the West Des Moines Historical Society, and it's a, it's a great group to be involved with. And at Conjunction Media, we've named our business Conjunction Media because in astronomy, a conjunction is when the stars align. So I like to say that we make the stars align for you. And Gail's also given me a minute to talk about another service that uh, I'm excited to talk about at Conjunction Media, and that is creativity and innovation training. One thing that we see in the business world a lot through surveys, all kinds of surveys, is the importance of creative and innovative thinking skills in the workplace, and really just how difficult it is for employers to find and cultivate that skill in their workforce. So me, myself, I have a master's degree in education and my research focus was creativity and innovative thinking skills. So I've been able to bring that to a variety of different workplaces uh, through seminars and trainings and learning experiences like that. And so if you are part of a, a workplace where you think that would be valuable to you to create uh, employees that are forward thinking and innovative and independent problem solvers, things like that, that is, uh, that's an experience that I'd love to bring to your workplace as well. My website is creativedave.net. I am at the back table when we are finished with the presentation. I got a couple of books that you can check out as well. I call it the genius mode, creative and innovative thinking skills. And so I would be happy to talk to you uh, in person or via my website, creativedave.net. And uh, thank you very much. I'm gonna turn the microphone here over to Gail from the Historical Society. And this time I will remember to hold it up. Not that I forgot last time. Um, hi, welcome to the Iowa Files. We're so glad you're here, both live and virtually. Um, my name is Gail Brubaker. I'm the executive director for the West Des Moines Historical Society. The Iowa Files uh, are presented by the West Des Moines Historical Society and the West Des Moines Public Library, who are awesome to work with. All the Iowa Files programs are free and open to the public thanks to the support of our members and donors, EMC Insurance Foundation, the West Des Moines Library Friends Foundation, and the Iowa Arts Council. And today we are absolutely thrilled to have Ms. Snyder here today thanks to Humanities Iowa. That was very nicely done. All right, I've got a quick... Wow, the Queen of England could not have done that better. I have a quick quiz for you today. As of 2017, how many incorporated cities and towns were there in Iowa? Any guesses? You can shout them out. Rod, put me on the spot. I have no idea. That is not the answer. <laughs> I have no idea. 943. 
Okay. There are Iowa towns that begin with every letter of the alphabet except for one. What is, I see you Googling. Okay. okay. What is the one letter that is not represented? Q, no, we have Qs. X, yes. X is the only one. There is Xenia in Hardin County, but it is not incorporated. You could win like money with these. So you, <laughs> there is one Iowa town that is the only one with its name in the whole world. Does anybody know what that one is? Say that again. There is one Iowa town that is the only, its name is the only town in the whole world with this name. Watching. Primgar, up in North Iowa. It's the first initials of the uh, folks who kind of founded the town and platted it out. There is only one Primgar in the whole world, and it's in Iowa. Okay, well, thank you and go home. Uh, oh, wait, no. We want to hear about Iowa ghost towns, don't we? Rosa Snyder is a graduate of Iowa State University with degrees in child development, art education, and interior design. Additional history courses from Drake University and Iowa Wesleyan College. She's taught art in Ames, worked as a design consultant and artist for the Meredith and Hearst Corporations. She is the author and publisher of a unique souvenir book, Glimpses of Iowa's Capital. For the past several years, Rosa has been researching old towns, traveling around Iowa to explore these old sites, taking photographs and interviewing folks who lived there and collecting their stories, which is an important part of history, right? So ladies and gentlemen, we are so thrilled to welcome Rosa Snyder. Uh, thank you, Gail, for inviting me. Uh, I usually wear my shirt, love what you do and do what you love but it was in the laundry today, so uh, I had to use this one instead. Um, I want to thank Gail and also the West Des Moines Historical Society for inviting me. Uh, before COVID, um, there were so many people interested in abandoned towns that uh, I was fully booked. And of course, since COVID, this is my first one. So remember, I'm still practicing, okay. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Polk County first, uh, since Gail brought up the number of towns. Polk County had uh, over 29 platted towns that are no longer um, with us today. In 1857, there were five towns that were incorporated into the city of Des Moines. In 1899, there were eight towns that were incorporated. And then there are also eight communities that became a part of Des Moines. So anyway, I have this list here and it's my cheat sheet, but in case you're interested in learning about any of the communities, communities specific to Polk County, uh, just uh, come up and we'll talk about it or you can ask me after the program. All righty. <clears throat> Uh, why does this matter? I know you can read this, but I love this saying, towns are truly windows to the past. Documenting these sites helps to keep their names and memories from oblivion. And pictures are for tomorrow. You'd be surprised in the number of places that I visit where I will inquire, do you have photos in your archives? No, you know, we just uh, don't have room for them or we don't have the time to go through them because people like to bring their family photos, et cetera, et cetera. But photos, you know, once you see something, you just don't forget it. The birth of a town during the 1833 through 1865, the things on the left are what made towns become towns. Farming needs, manufacturing, railroad, hopeful. So many of them thought the railroads were going to go through. Um, religious, ethnic, political, and speculative. And then during the 1860s through the 20s, the railroads were the big uh, draws for people uh, to form towns. And of course, the railroad companies knew how to pit one town against the other saying, hey, I got a railroad. I'm gonna bring that railroad through. 
what are you going to do for me? That type of thing. And there's a story, there's a town that that actually happened to. And these are the things that cause the railroads to die. Farming, you know, my mom says, farming just isn't the way it used to be. It's corporate farming. All the little communities in my area are struggling if they haven't totally disappeared because the farmers don't need the services anymore because we have cor big corporations that uh, farm most of the land around my area. So you can read through those. And of course, my hometown, they don't go through town anymore because they have a four lane highway that goes past the town. So most of the businesses have, uh, new businesses have moved out to that four laner. I wanna show you some uh, different slides of the way that Iowa was developed. And this shows you the Indian land and how the town started on the east and moved to the west. And notice way up on the northwest area, 1857. But the towns along the river, Mississippi River, of course, were established much earlier because of the land that the Indians had given to the state. And a lot of towns were along the rivers. Look at all of them. And why was that? Because river transportation was very uh, easy and they would use the rivers to get different places. Look at all, all of the um, settlements there. The water was also used to create mills that made uh, ground wheat and corn and also to help with the wood sawmills. And also the stagecoach had a lot to do with some of the formation of the towns. Looks like a spider web, doesn't it? And this is how the railroad construction uh, developed from 1855 and it still continued to 1880 and longer. If I go too fast, just let me know. I've seen these a few times, so it's hard for me to go slow. And coal mining, remember uh, in our list, we listed uh, natural resources. These are all the counties that have coal deposits, but these are the counties that had the most, the ones with the black totally uh, had the most production and it goes down to countries or counties just produ producing some coal. Uh, how many people are here from Polk County? Maybe I should have said how many aren't from Polk County. <laughs> what county are you from, hon? I'm from Madison. Sorry? Madison. Oh, okay. All right, anyone else? All righty, so we're most, mostly Polk County people. And these are the counties that we're going to visit today. Um, we went to Dale City, which is in Guthrie County, Indian Town. Liberty Center, Marietta, Monroe City, Ortonville, and Zooksburg. Anybody hear of these? No? Yes? I have Ortonville. Ortonville? Okay. Uh, Dale City was a woolen mill. At one time, the post office was called Dale City, and another time it was called Dale. The government decided most of the time uh, if a town could be called the name that it wanted to be because there were post offices there. And if the name was the same or the name was too similar, they would say, no, sorry, you can't use that name. Now, why Dale City was changed to Dale, I don't know. But uh, the sign along the area is still today, Dale. And it's in the southeast part of Guthrie Center, out on a gravel road. And there's Dale, established 1861, population 13. You have to know where it is to find it. But that's what I love to do. I love the hunt. I love the hunt. It was a road that uh, the stagecoaches used. It was a river road. And it was a main road between Des Moines and Omaha. So they got a lot of traffic. And this is what you see when you come from the west 
You see the um, South Raccoon River uh, Valley area. And, you know, like I said, they established along the river so that Mr. Lonsdale could have a woolen mill. And there's the town of Dale City. Uh, this is a hotel, uh, Pennsylvania. I had a hard time figuring out what that word was, but I finally find, found something that told me what it was. This was a spring that uh, the people of the town would use for water and also um, uh, the house. And Mr. Lonsdale uh, lived here, the church, the school, the store, and then the bridge. The bridge wasn't always there ferry that went across. And this is a picture of the farmstead. This was the large house that he built after he built his uh, first one. And this is Mr. and Mrs. Lonsdale. People ask me, why is Miss, Mrs. Lonsdale frowning? And I go, well, I don't, don't really know. But uh, maybe it was hard times or whatever. But a lot of the women photographs, they're not smiling. To the far uh, left, that's the first house that he built. And a couple of years later, he built the house that you see in the upper right. He came from England. He learned how to weave clothing from his father. And the land in Guthrie County was very inexpensive at that time, a dollar and 25 cents an acre. And he bought 2,500 acres. And there's the area where Lonsdale Mill is. I love it that they have the signage still up. Now, Mr. and Mrs. Lonsdale had uh, four children one girl and three boys. <clears throat> the two, two of the three boys helped with the farming and the woolen mill. The, the uh, third son became a doctor up in Minnesota. And here's a picture of the woolen mill. They're out there fishing. The upper left one, and this is the first building that uh, he built. And to the right is the second building that he constructed. And the bottom one, of course, is inside of the uh, woolen mill. He also uh, looked for coal and found coal along the river, which was very common here in Iowa. And also, um, he had a mill that he established, a different type of mill. Uh, wheat was very important in Iowa. Um, I visited a gentleman. I just kind of go to the town, and if somebody's outside, uh, I'll stop and uh, visit with them. And it happened to be Jim Lonsdale. He's fifth generation of the Lonsdale family. He still lives in Dale City. And he said, hey, why don't you come down? His wife was there. And come down to the basement. I want to show you what I have in my safe. And here was that packet right there. This is how they laid out the design for the uh, woolen products. And these are samples, and he still has them. Isn't that wonderful? And they would travel around the salesman with that bag to sell, to promote, and make orders for the woolen blankets. He uh, acquired wool from area farmers. And unfortunately, during the First World War, that he couldn't get the dyes for the, for, the, for the woolen mills. And so it had to close up. <clears throat> Notice the picture of the church. To the left and to the right, uh, his daughter started a winery. It's no longer there anymore, but that was the winery from the former um, church building. And I went there one day so I could meet them and go inside of the winery. And they had music there. And it happened to be that their daughter was there singing. These are some of the houses that are still there. <clears throat> I don't know if this square house is an old um, Pennsylvania uh, hotel or not. It was square. It could be. But it fits 
It sits too close to the, to the road, but I might be mistaken. Uh, this house here, someone was living in there when I took a photo of it. And unfortunately, it's been abandoned. But what a beautiful home at one time it would have been. Just beautiful. And this is the home of Jim, Jim Lonsdale and Mary. And that's Jim. I love meeting people. I love interviewing them. And I like to take a picture of them if they're willing. <clears throat> Hope I don't go hoarse. Um, he has a cousin that lives in that house. And this house was used for the teachers in the school to stay. Also for some of the mill workers. <clears throat> and uh, most of the mill workers were women. They weren't all men. But they did have a building just for the men. And the hotel usually was uh, used for traveling salesmen or people that came on the stage and had to have a place to live or stay. And this is still sitting there. This is a pipe used in the mill. And now we're going to go to Indian Town. <clears throat> I'm going to let you read that. And it's located on the east or the west border of Cass County. Now, Indian Town was initially, um, this population were the uh, Potawatomi Indians. So when the Mormons came through later on, they decided to call their community Indian Town. And when they left, the pioneers came and they then platted the town of Indian Town and left the name as Indian Town. Uh, notice the Oregon Trail coming through, the Mormon Trail coming through. Uh, have you heard of the Hitchcock House? Uh, that's where it was, right there. There was a, a ferry right here along the river. And there was another town only a mile away called Iranistan. Now, why would there be a town and then somebody else would start a town a mile away? I don't know, but that's what they did. They had business, a lot of business, until guess what town became the county seat, Lewis. And then both Iranistan and Indian Town, people moved their businesses to the new town of Lewis. This is what's there now, just a, a prairie, prairie field. There used to be this marker there, but it was moved into the public park in Lewis. And this is what it said. Can you all read that or do you want me to read it for you? Lewis. When Lewis became the county seat. But why would they just leave the marker there? Oh, I'm sorry, the marker? I don't really know uh, the answer to that. I wondered that myself. I never found anyone that I could visit with at that time that knew why it had been there for a while. And if this, things aren't recorded, then people go, well, I don't know. It's just been there, you know, while I've lived here in this town. It's at Market Square Park. Now the Mormons, when they came through, went all the way to the Missouri border and they had a big meeting there and then uh, they would divide into small groups and move back east where many of them bought land and farmed the land until they were ready to move to Utah. So they were in this area for about five to six years, although some stayed longer because they needed to get their land sold before they started out for Utah. 
And after they left, like I said, um, some pioneers came and platted that town and uh, were there until uh, Lewis became the county seat. And then, of course, now Atlantic is the county seat. So see how it gets moved around? There's a railroad that came through Atlantic, and there's a lot of uh, powers to be, and they got it moved. Doesn't happen today, right? That doesn't happen anymore. And this is the ferry. Originally, it sat along the river, but the river was uh, straightened. And so it's really weird because when you go there, you go, why is there a ferry house sitting here? And that is why. And it's on the National Register of Historic Places. Notice it says the gateway to the west. This was a very busy road. That's why Iranistan and Indian Town uh, could have so many businesses because of the stagecoach and because people were going during the gold rush, etc., cetera, uh, to the west. Now we're going to go to Liberty Center. They, too, wanted to have a railroad. Didn't have it. Lacona got it. It's in Warren County. It's in the southern part of Warren County. There's even a sign. It's an un, in, unincorporated town. Never incorporated ever. The township is the uh, body governing body that takes care of, um, you know, things in the whole county or township. I mean, it's a township thing. But there's a plaque. This is a photo of Phil Thomas. He's the one that shared so many wonderful photos and information with me. And his, uh, he's fifth generation. Uh, the original person who owned the land where Liberty Center was was Jeremiah Boston. Unfortunately, I was, um, unfortunately, uh, Phil passed away shortly after I, he gave me this photo. And I'm glad that I had the opportunity to visit with him and, and get his photo. I always say, you have to do what you always are going to, because soon it becomes too late. And I was always going to go there, or I always going to get that, and then it's too late. So that's Phil Thomas, and this is in memory of him. This is called sort of a crossroads town. There were two uh, churches there. A lot of Quaker people and Liberty Center, the name of it has to do with the, like the Civil War, Liberty, Freedom, and that's how it got its name. This is the oldest house or was the oldest house that uh, was in Liberty Center. Mrs. Fletcher was 100 years old. She smoked a pipe, but she fell asleep and needless to say, she passed away when the house burned with her. So don't be smoking your pipes, girls. Uh, this is one of the churches that's still in existence at Liberty Center. It's the United Methodist Church. They have a membership of about 60 to 80 people. They have a wonderful annual um, fall dinner. And I've been there several times to ra help raise money. That They have it in their high school to support the church. This is the original town site, the lower right one. In 1921, there was a bad fire. And back in those days, you know, the buildings were made out of wood. And when one uh, building started a fire, it usually took all of them. And it did all of those along uh, the street there. The um, structure in front of you uh, was there until they paved the road that went by Liberty Center and they moved that to another town. But that town I went to check and it's not there anymore. They tore it down and built a new one. Uh, this is one of the two stores. Uh, this is the first store and they held um, um, different lodge meetings up on the second floor. They owned it actually. And then the groceries was on the first floor. And that church that you see was the second church. It was a Quaker church. And they tore it down and uh, took the wood and built a Quaker church in Ash, 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 Ashworth. This is the second church. 
I mean, second uh, general store. And uh, this is a building that is there now where that uh, general store was. They had lots and lots of business in that area to handle two general, big general stores. The school was held in that top floor of this building for a while. Some of the social activities, uh, you know, they had a band, they had the women's guild, the kids, uh, Phil said, would come into town and ride their bikes because out on the farm there wasn't much to do. They showed uh, movies on the wall of one of the businesses and they just had a fun time there, he said. And there was a doctor there, Dr. Moore, and I know his uh, descendant, Janice Rubel. So she gave me a picture of her, her uh, grandfather or great-grandfather. And this was the house that he lived in. And I'm so glad that I got a photo of it because it's no longer there. And this is what he took to when he would go out and visit people in their homes. Uh, and sometimes they would come to him. First by wagon, and then he bought himself a fancy car. Isn't that cool? These are some of the buildings that uh, used to be in use, the upper left, that used to have a restaurant in it. Then they moved just uh, mailboxes to the front of it, and somebody lived in the back. And the last time I was in Liberty Center, they just had mailboxes outside, uh, metal ones. Uh, uh, that we see a lot in different developments here in the city. The building to the right used to be a country school, and they moved it in and made it into a store. The building to your left was the hotel, and again, salesmen would come, teachers would stay there, etc. And there were two gas stations. One was this Texaco station. That building is still standing. All of these, of course. Well, no, the one on the upper right is not because the, the um, uh, fraternity that used that uh, tore it down and built a new metal building. And there's the second gas station, and there's a garage and a feed store to the lower right. And this was the bank. The bank only lasted for about uh, 10 years. In 1921, it closed up. And after that, the doctor, Dr. Moore, that uh, I let you see, or that you saw earlier, had his office there. Now, one thing that keeps this town alive today is the Southeast Warren School. Uh, unfortunately, when schools uh, close and they reconsolidate again and again, uh, causes a, a town to die. This is where they have their monthly uh, or their yearly uh, fundraisers for the church. And these are some of the houses, lovely in their day. And this is another couple, uh, Joanne and Noel Vincent invited me into their home. This was the old high school, the or school. <clears throat> the senior high was on the left of that building and the uh, lower grades was to the right and they bought that building and converted it into their home. And when I was ready to leave, she said, oh, you can't leave yet, I made a pie. A what? I made you a lemon pie. Oh my goodness sake, it was the best lemon pie I ever ate. I had to visit them again because he had some additional photos and guess what? She baked me another pie. <laughs> How lucky is that? Wow. The next area we're gonna to go to is Marietta. This was the county seat in Marshall County before Marshalltown. Uh, actually, Marshalltown was first called Marshall when it was um, made the county seat. It's in the upper, or sort of the middle of Marshall County. And when you look from the road, you look down to the Iowa River and at that time, they thought the soil uh, flood zone was a good place because it would grow a lot of crops. They had water, they had transportation, they had water for mills, et cetera, et cetera. And so three commissioners um, were chosen from different counties to select the county seat. 
They didn't pick anyone from their county, just from counties uh, who knows why they chose certain ones. And they chose this area of Marietta. Marietta, I have a friend, Marietta, Marietta. But look how big it was. Had a hotel, a school, had lots of different businesses. But a man, uh, na a man by the name of Anson wanted to start his own town. And so he started the town of Marshalltown. There were bitter fights because he wanted the county seat moved there. He even built a courthouse and said, hey, I'll give it to you for free if you move the county seat here. Well, they had court cases after court cases for seven solid years. The first time they tried to move the records, about 500 people came with guns. They were going to take the uh, records out of the courthouse, which was a uh, um, log cabin house, our building, and they were going to take them. Well, the people from this area said, no, you're not. So they pulled their guns. They stood 16 feet apart. All Everybody was holding a gun at each other, you know, across the, the line there. He had arrived early in the morning, and finally somebody said, now, don't kill yourself over this. This is stupid. You know, don't be doing this. And the guys that came, they were getting hungry, so they said, okay, what the heck, we'll go back home now. <laughs> so they went home, but then they tried to get it again and again and again, and seven years later, after much manipulation, uh, paying people off, um, persuading people that that town was just going to flood, then the courthouse was actually moved to Marshalltown. There's still a lot of people that live there, but the businesses eventually moved to the city of Marshalltown. The courthouse uh, was moved to the around the square of Marshalltown and later was moved to this area. I have the address. So I thought, well, I'll just go and check. I'll take a picture of it. Well, there was a man and he saw I was taking a picture. He said, what are you taking a picture of this for? And I told him, he said, well, come on in. He said, I'm going to take you downstairs and show you the beams that were in the uh, courthouse. So I got to uh, uh, take a picture of that. It's just the back part of that building, not the front part. That building now is an apartment complex. My friends say, you can talk to anybody, don't you? And I said, yeah, I can. As long as I feel safe, I will. This is what remains of the city of Marietta. Mary, Marietta. Let's see where the courthouse was in the square. And these are some of the houses. I used to go by there when I went to school at Iowa State all the time, not knowing that it had been the former county seat of Marshall County. I went by this house and admired it for years and years and years. This was the Robert uh, Timmons house, and he was a trader and a teamster that hauled products from bigger cities to the small community. He had seven children, and many of his uh, the daughters were married in that house and came down the beautiful staircase. And I'm glad uh, that I could acquire this picture of that house before it was turn, uh, torn down in 1997. There's now the Timmons Grove that marks uh, uh, his name, you know, a memory of him. His children, the Indians used to come, and his children would... Uh, come down to the uh, wooded area where the Indians stayed and they would play with them and uh, get trinkets, et cetera, et cetera. And now it's a place where you can camp. So if you go by that area straight north of um, Marshalltown, you'll see Timmins Grove. And there is Marietta uh, Cemetery. That's the only name that you see that names the town, which is very common. Uh, the cemeteries exist, and that's about it that reminds you of the town. And the next place we're going to go to is Monroe City. 
Uh, it was supposed to be the capital of our state. The capital building in Iowa City was not finished. They had acquired more land because of the Indian uh, Indians giving um, or us taking the land from the Indian, vice versa. And so they wanted to have a more centrally located position. So again, they got three commissioners and they said, explore the area and find a place where we can move the capital uh, to a more centrally located position. This is all I have of Monroe City. Those are the lots that the three commission commissioners chose. Uh, they're not lots, they're actually sections of the county. Now, the three commissioners who chose this, um, I've never found the uh, plat of this city, but the three commissioners said, now, let's not say where this is going to be until we have informed the governor and the legislator where their new capital is going to be. But uh-oh, one of the guys from one of the counties, and I won't name the county, said, don't tell anybody, but we're going to move the capital to this area. Well, people from one of uh, town, um, uh, Mahaska, in Mahaska County, Oskaloosa, noticed all these people coming through their county and said, where in the earth of all these people going? Well, they were coming to look over the area because they wanted to buy land around the capital. And, you know, that was an investment and make money. Well, they also found out that there was a marshal that was paid to convince the um, people to choose this area and they found out some other things so there was an investigation and the legislator or the group that investigated said okay no way we're not going to have the capital there we're going to choose three other people and we're going to locate it someplace else and so that was the end of monroe city it's actually between prairie city and the town of monroe and i've actually driven that area with the tour guide at the Iowa State Capitol because she likes to explore as well. Now we're going to go to Ortonville. This was a circus town. One person said they knew about Ortonville. It's straight west of Waukee. There uh, was a railroad there, so they've done a nice job marking uh, where it's located. <clears throat> it's the lower red dot, just west of Waukee and east of Adel. And there's the sign, welcome to Ortonville. Anyone that sees that, I'm sure they go, what are they talking about? But they have uh, information about Ortonville there, which I think is wonderful. And this is Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Orton. He actually worked on the Superior Lake Superior as a, a sailor. And he took his family of seven to Chicago and they went to a circus. And he thought to himself, my kids can do that. Well, he didn't have all of those. He had seven of those. Um, and those seven children had children. So he formed the circus uh, first in Wisconsin. And then uh, during one of his um, uh, trips through Iowa, he found the area and he decided to move his uh, winter camp to that area. And they built this house. One of the sons was RZ, but they would stay in the house. And the other, one of the other sons that participated in the circus a lot was Miles. And you can see the circus rings, two of them there. And so in the winter time, they would stay there and practice their circus acts. And there's the elevator at Ortonville. They had a store, ended up being a beauty parlor and some other businesses. And pitched their tents and they'd stay in their little wagons that they would take. And look at this uh, contract. This is a contract for Elwood Emery. He got paid $20 per week. 
The management, though, took $10 per week for table, board, from wages. So that means he got $10 a week. And um, <clears throat> this person was a boss of the animal. He was called the Animal Man and Trainer. He was employed in 1929. And if he stayed the whole trip, that whole season, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, 12 months out of the year. But if he stayed the whole time, he, they got $2.50 per month reward for faithful service. Now, the boys were able to go out and date local girls, but the girls weren't because if they got married to somebody who wasn't connected with the circus, then they would leave the circus. So daddy uh, was very stern and didn't let the didn't want the girls. There are some stories of one of them that ventured out, but uh, we won't get into that. But um, anyway, he was very strict and the girls weren't allowed to date anyone that wasn't connected with the circus. And these are some of the posters. Uh, Adel Historical Museum has wonderful, wonderful things. A whole room about uh, the Orton, Orton, Orton Circus. And look at the trip. Carlisle, they started in Carlisle, Iowa, May 2nd. Notice that they only spent one day in every town. And Sundays, they didn't have to work, which is great. And the last one was in Gowrie, Iowa, October 21. Look at that approximate distance, 2,500 miles. Now, they would come into town with their horses and their wagons playing music to attract people. Isn't that beautiful? These were the two elephants that performed in the circus. They had a lot of wild animals, but most of them were just to attract the people to come. When they would come into a town, uh, their band would be playing music, they would form a circle, and then Mr. Horton would broadcast what they were going to see. And that would attract the people, and uh, I think it cost 25 cents to get in. But the lions, they were just to look at, they did not perform like they did in the Barham and Bailey Circus. When they come into town, they bring their wagons, can you imagine every day? pulling all that stuff out, setting up the tents. When they started, it was a one ring and later on developed into three rings. Uh, when Mr. Horton uh, passed away, uh, RZ took charge of it and he tried to make it into a railroad circus, which means that they would travel by railroad, but it didn't work out uh, very well for some reason. Here they are pitching the tent. That was when it was a three ringer. Look at that. Can you imagine swinging around there? Mm. The clown there be, uh, kneeling down is Miles. He's one of the sons. The girls and boys started as soon as they could walk, some at the age of two. Um, and as they got older, then they had to do more of the um, acrobats that were a little bit more um, scary, I guess I would say. And there's Miles. There's some of the others that performed in the circus, family members, some are outside people. They had a girls band, but if there weren't enough girls, then the boys, uh, got enlisted into the band. And there's some flyers. Uh, Gracie is in the upper or the far right. She's a daughter of Miles. She and her husband has, uh, made up this uh, new aerial um, sway, sway pole act. He, her husband actually fell because uh, they didn't have um, any protection. He was crippled, I believe, I'm not sure, but I think so. And she did some other things on her own. 
And there's Miles and his daughter, Gracie. And this is the house that used to sit south of uh, the highway. And that was Miles' house. This is a sign that still sits there. There's several businesses, but they're big, you know, corporate businesses in that area. And our last town we're going to visit today is Zooksburg. It was named after one of the railroad men called H. Zook. And there was a railroad spur, so they called the community Zook Spur. Population 500 at one time. It's lo uh, located on the upper right uh, corner, the red dot there in Dallas County. This sounds, sign is still there. Welcome to Zooksburg, the town too tough to die. And this is the plat. There was actually three Catholic or three churches. Um, down here is a Catholic church, and there's a church there and a church here. One was a Protestant church. One was the church for the black people that uh, worked in the mines. Many of them came from Buxton. If you've ever read the books about Buxton, Iowa, when it closed, and a lot of the uh, workers there, many of them were black. Uh, uh, went to work at other coal mining uh, communities. There's the uh, store right here. Down here is where the school was. I'll show you a picture of that. This is a picture of the Zook Spur Mine. Um, Madrid Museum, Historic Museum, has a wonderful display of what it's like to be down in the coal mines. I'm claustrophobic, so needless to say, um, I wouldn't have been able to have that job. And this is the uh, shale that they that was left over from mining the coal. This isn't in that area. Um, I was over in the Boone County area, and this is the only one that I'm aware of that still exists, so I thought you might like to see that. Those kind of... Uh, uh, remnants of the coal mines uh, existed all over those counties that I showed you earlier that used to have a lot of coal mining. This is the houses that they had in Zooksburg. That's one of the nine wells that they had there. Some of the houses were uh, owned by some of the miners and some they just rented, $8 a month. Uh, needless to say, they weren't... Uh, didn't have all the luxuries that we're so used to today. This was the schoolhouse that I pointed out to you. They would go to elementary school and then they would head up to Madrid. They'd ride the train to go uh, to Madrid. This was a Italian bakery. The only thing that you can see today is the foundation, but you have to know to look for it. It's right where that sign was that I showed you. And they, uh, the kids would save their pennies sometimes and go down and, and get a bakery good. But that lasted for many, many years. There were Croatians, Italians, Irish, uh, all nationalities and blacks that worked in the mines. And they said they got along just fine. You know, we were um, segregated. Not segregated, the opposite of. Sorry. Integrated. Integrated. Thank you for that. <laughs> and this is the barn where the mules that went down into the mines would stay uh, during the summer. Now they had to come out because uh, they didn't mind during the the winter, and they had to bring them out slowly because if they didn't, it would cause uh, problems with their eye, eyesight. And that barn is still there. In fact, the gentleman that owns this farmstead, he had donated uh, the house in the barn to the Madrid Historical Society. And right before COVID, uh, they were talking about having teas and programs there, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, you know how it is. This is the only house uh, in the town of Zooksburg that still exists. There's many houses like this that are scattered around the countryside because they did move them to different places. 
but this was a typical shape, not with a little porch added on to the back. Um, when I first got married, I lived uh, in Oskaloosa, Iowa, because my hub husband took his uh, first civil engineering job there, and we lived in a miner's house, very similar to that. And there's a sign that still donate, uh, uh, shows uh, Zuckspur. And this is Christine. She was very helpful in giving me information, talking with me, etc. And she was an actual coal miner's daughter. Now, her dad did not work in the Zuckspur mine. He worked in a mine that was to the east of um, Madrid. And she's also a board member of the Madrid Historical Society. Look at those wonderful pictures. I love the pictures. So what can we do? We can do historic research. We can take and collect photographs um, and establish a centralized uh, location. I know that down at Penn College, uh, they had, uh, I don't know how many, a weekend or three days where people came in, told their stories and brought photographs and they scanned them. And they have a wonderful, wonderful collection of photographs that people have uh, brought to them. Write and document towns and collect stories. That's what I do, but um, I'm getting more mature and uh, um, I don't know how much longer I will do that. <clears throat> also place signage at sites uh, with a tour map. Um, Guthrie County has done a wonderful job. Guthrie, um, yeah, Guthrie Conservation Department. They have a map and they show you where the towns are and uh, so they can go out and explore. So that's what I promote is for all of us to do this. That's been my mission. Uh, the reason I got interested in doing this is because I was uh, the president of Polk County Historical Society, which has uh, disbanded, uh, membership declined and people just didn't want to um, participate in things. And one of our ideas was to do this very thing, was to find the towns in Polk County and to put signage up and to do a tour map. But uh, before that, a few of our members who were very, very active, Leroy Pratt was very active in our organization, passed away. And we just didn't have the manpower uh, to do that. So I got interested in that. And then, uh, I don't know, I got the bug and I love to hunt. And so uh, that's why I'm here today to share all of this with you. Thank you. If there's any questions, uh, please uh, ask any questions you have. And the other thing is that if you want to find out where these towns that I talked about today, if you'd like to go explore yourself, I have a little paper here if you'd like to pick up one. Okay, question. To go back to the state map that you have that shows all the different towns that we were you were talking about. Yes. <coughs> could you, could you oh, could I? All right. I think I'll have to do it this way. I don't know how else to do it. <coughs> I could try to do it in reverse. What do you think about that? Give the program in reverse. That'd be a challenge. Yeah. There, oh, no. There we go. All right. Thank you. Of course. Does anybody have any questions about any uh, abandoned or uh, towns in Polk County? Okay. Oh, okay. Um, do you know where Biagi's is out on the corner of University and um, 60th? There used to be a town there. Yeah. It didn't amount to much. Many of the towns uh, were called paper towns because they would be platted, nothing would happen. And so uh, that would have been a paper town. What was the name of the town? Um, Mount Auburn. 
Mount Auburn. There was a church out there as well. Uh, Ashua, it was platted, but it was just a railroad stop. It didn't, uh, it was uh, west of Valley Junction. Uh, Mitchellville, you know Mitchellville? Okay. Uh, there was a town called Mitchell, just north of Mitchellville, but again, that old railroad came through and it came down south of his town. So he moved his town literally to Mitchellville and called it Mitchellville. He also started a town, laid out the town of Jericho, and that would have been west of Marsh, uh, Mitchellville. He also started the town of Ottawa, and Ottawa would have been east of Maxwell. So he started Mitchell, and then he started Mitchellville, he started Ottawa, he started Jericho, and there's another one if I can find it here. Hmm. Yes, and there's some wonderful signage there. Uh, he, when he came here, um, uh, the land was not open up to the public yet. Um, if you know where Red Rock, there was a line there and people had to stay on the east side of Red Rock until, I don't remember the year of it, that they could then come over and uh, claim the land. And so he was given permission to come here because the fort was here to protect the Indians from the white people who wanted to take the land before they were supposed to. And he had permission to help um, farm the land to, for corn and stuff to feed the uh, horses at the fort. And so he stayed, some of the people left, um, but there were several people that were allowed to come in and, and help support the fort. <clears throat> I can't find that other town, sorry. Um, um, there's camp, there's uh, nine different coal mining areas, Norwoodville, you've heard of that, there was coal mining there, Carbondale was uh, between here and, and uh, Pleasant Hill, Kearney is unincorporated, um, that's on the highway going to Ankeny, oh there's just a lot of them, a lot, a lot, a lot of them, does that help you there? Kelsey, Campbell, Campbell's right by me by the, in Clive, just north of where that Audubon city used to be. Yes, question? I've seen on some maps, uh, Swanwood and Lovington, were they towns? Uh, Swanwood, yes. Um, let's see. You know, there's a dispute whether, just because they have a post office, is it a town? or if it has a railroad stop, and Swanwood was a railroad stop. I personally don't call a town a town if it just had a post office because it was in somebody's house or on their front porch. Swanwood was a railroad stop. I don't have those on my list, but I do know that from memory. But there are a lot of places, and sometimes the railroad stops developed into a town. You just never knew. But there are a lot of towns along the railroads that uh, started and, and disappeared. Yes, question. I'm just kind of curious about how you start your research or find out about these places and if you are planning to expand to like other areas of Iowa. I have several different presentations. Uh, obviously, what time is it? I've, uh, you know, I've done an hour worth right now and if you really do what I do, it takes longer, you know, to just cover those towns, but I like covering them in full. Uh, I love to do the photos so that it's like you and I are going on a little road trip and you just sit back in that chair and I'll take you. Um, uh, it would be great if there would be other people who would do each county and do it this way with photographs. Uh, how did I start? Um, I worked at, after, I was a restoration painter at the Iowa State Capitol building and my back went out. I uh, didn't like being that bent backwards. So um, I started doing historic research for the architects who are doing restoration. Um, and then I got interested because of being a member of Polk County 
Historical Society. So I knew how to do research. Uh, I spent a lot of hours at the State Library. Unfortunately, now the only way you can get there is to make an appointment and you can't go around and look at the books. You have to ask for a specific book and then they'll bring that book down. And when you're done with it, then you have to request another book. So it takes longer, but they'll get it. You know, it'll be better. I just keep saying it'll be better. Did that answer your question? Yeah. I guess, how do you find out about these town towns? Just doing the research on the library? I just read a lot, okay. and then uh, I drop in. Yeah, <laughs> that's the best part. Yeah, yeah I just drop in. <laughs> and people are so willing to share and tell you the stories and, and that kind of thing. And I really love that part about it, or of it. Yeah, I've done my own county. I've done probably... 66% of the counties. Uh, it's hard to do the along the Mississippi River because there were so many, 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 and they were done so long ago. But uh, like I said, uh, that's what I do. COVID time, I just sit and read and read and read. All of a sudden, it's supper time. We got to get supper ready. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you go to different libraries. I came to. Uh, West Des Moines Library, all the libraries in the city area, and they some of them have really good books to look at and do research. And then when I uh, decided to do the programs, I tried to to do um, towns that were different. So I wasn't just talking about railroad towns, and you know I could do that, and you know I'll do the same thing. And most of the towns had the same type of businesses: a general store, blacksmith shop a wagon maker, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, so anyway, but I have uh, four different presentations that I put together that covers different towns. So anyone else? Uh, thank you for letting me talk. If anybody wants to see the other towns that Rosa has uh, researched, you go to Humanities Iowa and they have the Speakers Bureau list. So you can maybe start your own research or see what other towns are available. Uh, our next program will be Sunday, November 21st. Vince Valdez, who hopefully you've heard of this amazing gentleman, musician, filmmaker, former Des Moines Police uh, Department spokesperson, lifelong West Des Moines resident, will be discussing Latino lives in Valley Junction. So that again will be in person here, live streamed on YouTube and our Facebook page. Thank you so much for coming today and have a great rest of your Sunday.